Hello and welcome to Embedded. I'm Elysia White alongside Christopher White. Our guest this week is Miro Samek. We're going to talk about what to do when you don't want an RTOS, but you need to go beyond the wow one loop. Before we get started with Miro, we are ending the Tinker Kit contest. We have a winner. Yay! Benja Blom. He is going to use the Tinker Kit to start playing with robots and hopefully make it fun enough for his baby boy to enjoy his robot. I think that sounds like a great use for that kit. Hi, Mero. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, hi, Chris. Hi, Alicia. Uh, thank you for inviting me to your show. We had many listeners re- request you, so I should have invited you months ago. I'm glad you could make time for us. Uh, can you tell us about yourself? Well, sure. Um, I, I grew up in Poland. Um, I studied physics all the way to PhD level, actually. And, but then I, um, I had a chance to do my PhD research in Germany, and I fell in love with um, programming, and especially real-time programming. So after my uh, year of postdoc, I, I came to the U.S., and I somehow managed to get a job at GE Medical Systems as a software engineer. Later, I, um, I moved uh, to the Bay Area and uh, worked for two Silicon Valley uh, companies in the field of GPS. Well, that was at this time that I uh, also developed um, the first versions of the software that later became a QP framework. And I also wrote my first book uh, that explained the framework and all the concepts related to it. Finally, in 2005, I started my own software company called Quantum Leaps uh, that um, develops and uh, uh, develops the, uh, and sells the QP framework, as well as the uh, QM modeling tool based on UML state machines. Cool. And that's what you're doing now? Yes, that's uh, exactly what I've been doing for the past um, 11 years. But you didn't mention that you have a bunch of videos that you've been teaching people how to do embedded systems? Well, that's, uh, that's uh, among others, uh, what, I, what I do. I, I think that um, um, there is not enough resources that the newcomers to the field can learn from. So I, uh, in 2013, it was my New Year's resolution, I started teaching an embedded uh, software a course on YouTube, and, and it uh, got quite popular, I would say. Excellent. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but we do want to do lightning round where we ask you questions and want short answers. And if we are behaving, we won't ask you for long explanations about why and how. So Chris, you want to get started? Sure. Uh, Object oriented or procedural programming? I prefer object oriented. Would you rather explain leakage inductance or API design? API design. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite fictional robot? Uh, well, I think that R2-D2 was, was uh, funny, but maybe Wally was lovely too. <laughs> okay, I can see a tie between those. What is your favorite programming language? Um, I program in C and C++. Um, so probably, probably C++, I would say. Which language do you think should be taught in the first CS course? Well, I think that it should be possibly low-level, high-level language, which uh, means C. And actually, a longer version of this, of my answer to this question would be my embedded uh, software course on YouTube. That uh, I teach C there, but I very frequently go um, all the way to the machine level, and I, I show disassembly and what happens uh, with your code with the C statements when they are actually executed on the ARM Cortex-M processor. That's interesting because I think that gets missed a lot in education, that that ability to drill down to the assembly and say, okay, here's what's really happening, without necessarily knowing assembly language, but being exactly. able to so, use it to debug. Mm-hmm. So my goal is not to teach uh, ARM assembly, but uh, just to show people who probably for the first time see uh, what uh, those machine instructions look like, what they do. What does it mean that uh, that you can teach com- or tell computer to do something in the real world, like to, to turn an LED on and off or something like that? 
And so when they when people knew learn how and see how how fundamental concepts context concepts are fun, uh, are implemented uh, ultimately, then they they use those concepts uh, much more confidently and with with um, you know program with more eff efficiency and and um, they they just um, understand this stuff much deeper. Yeah. Okay, I broke lightning round, so we're gonna get back you to that. Did so I'm <laughs> gonna ask a short question. Uh, what's your favorite physical constant? Um, probably Planck's constant. That's a good one. Uh, favorite processor? Uh, I would say that the best would be Renaissance RX. Although, of course, ARM Cortex M is is the most popular these days. How is the Renaissance RX different? Well, um, it is um, it is cleaner. It is not as complicated as ARM Cortex. Um, um, as you know, ARM has a lot of baggage, and uh, the processors had two instruction sets, Thumb and ARM. Now, uh, Cortex-M has only Thumb 2, but uh, some of this legacy still lives on. It has those modes and so on. Um, and the FPU introduced in Cortex-M 4 is a big problem. I mean, for uh, context switching, you have to remember all those registers. The context switch is longer and very complex. Somehow, Renaissance and Rex, on the other hand, managed to, to give you single precision FPU and all of this, and without any of this complexity. Hmm. Apparently, I need to go look some stuff up. That's neat. Chris, do you have any more? Uh, I can go as long as you want. <laughs> you picked all of them out, huh? I know. You want one more and I'll do one more? Yeah, sure. Uh, favorite planet? Favorite? Yeah. Well, the Earth. Okay, certainly. favorite planet besides the Earth. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't seem... <laughs> uh, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe maybe Jupiter. Is, uh, it's, it's a giant and probably very interesting. Probably maybe the moons of Jupiter are, uh, Jupiter are yeah. actually more yeah. interesting. Okay, last one. What science fiction technology or concept do you think will be real in our lifetimes? I think that um, the biggest potential is I see in some convergence between uh, nanoscale microelectronics and and biology, like genetics and uh, artificial s synthetic life. Something very cool is, might happen there. I don't know, micro robots or something like that. That's both very exciting and very scary at the same yes. time. Right. <laughs> I've read that science fiction novel. It didn't turn out well. So we talked to Jean Lebrasse about building a real-time operating system not too long ago. And then we talked about his operating system, the micro COS. And on the show, we talk a lot about running bare metal with a while loop, with the occasional interrupt, and definitely a state machine in there. But those aren't the only options. You talk about hierarchical state machines and and objects active objects can you tell us about those yeah i mean this is probably a longer story and uh, probably the best way is to start with what people already know which is the bare metal also called super loop sometimes also called main plus isr and sometimes also called foreground background system now so this 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 architecture is um, that you have, you know, your main function is being called. You have you run bare metal, so there is no operating system whatsoever in your system. And then you initialize your hardware and everything, and finally you enter an endless loop, while one or forever loop. Mm -hmm. And in this loop, for instance, for the venerable Blinky example, what you would do is you would um, wait for a certain period of time, say a thousand milliseconds, then you will turn an, the LED on, send an instruction to, to, to do this. Then you will wait, wait again for another thousand milliseconds and you will turn the LED off and then you will look, look back, which will in the end um, cause the LED blink once, you know, stay on for a second, stay off for, the, for a second, so blink once in a half seconds, uh, once in two seconds. Okay. 
And that makes so sense. I will, mean, we, yeah. we all do that when we exactly. boot up we a, a system. Exactly. We all do that, and that's why I wanted to start with something that we all do and know. This is also how, for instance, Arduino um, programming starts, and, and there is an Arduino Blink uh, tutorial out there on, on the web. Yes, but but we... We know that that's not where it ends. I mean, because that's not, not power ends, but, efficient, but this, and there's just so much better right. stuff to do. Right. Okay. And uh, but this introduces the the most important concept, which uh, I will call sequential programming. So you you program this um, based on sequence of of events. You you turn the LED, you wait, you turn it off, you wait, and so on. Now, how can you improve it? I mean, what are the the obvious uh, shortcomings here? First of all, it's difficult to extend. Because, for instance, let's say that you want to react to a button press. This button press, uh, you want to uh, obviously react faster than in one second that you wait. And so in order to react faster, uh, you would like to have probably a second such loop. And, um, and this is where Artos comes in, real-time operating system, because the job of an Artos is to allow multiple such background loops to run simultaneously on a single CPU. And the job of the Artos is then to make an illusion that all those forever loops, while one loops, have the CPU all to themselves. And how the Artos is doing this? So while in the sequential code, when you call the delay function, delay for 1,000 milliseconds, what is really happening is that this function spins in a tight polling loop and waits and wastes all those CPU cycles until the time elapses, and then it returns to the caller and proceeds. In the RTOS, it will be functional equivalent of this would be actually to, to put the calling task to sleep, meaning that it will be switched away out of the CPU, this this is called this process called context switch, and and then switch in a task that has probably something uh, has something useful to do, and then when the time elapses, the artist will do the opposite. It will switch the context again, and and will will return to the interrupted task which was blocked all this time. And so now we introduce the concept of efficient blocking based on the RTOS. And this is how most of the software is developed. And this is the role of RTOS. As, um, um, this is what, what the RTOS brings to the table, so to speak. Yeah, but I honestly wouldn't implement it that way. I mean, we're talking so far about an LED and a button. Even if you added 15 LEDs and 20 buttons, I wouldn't bother with an RTOS with that. I mean, an RTOS you do need sometimes, but it is a lot of overhead. That context switching is expensive, and understanding how the threads work is painful if you've never done it, and or if you have done it on a, on a more functional system than an embedded system, the way embedded threads work is also painful. Right. So this is way too much craft to make many systems work. Well, I, I would agree that uh, obviously a, a toy problem like the Blinky, that's all I have uh, time to explain. <laughs> uh, sure, you sure. Know, then, um, then it's um, obviously still small and, and uh, the, the super loop is much more scalable than this. So obviously uh, I, I wouldn't either. Uh, go with an Artos just to blink an uh, blink and LED and then perhaps react to a button press. This was just an example to to show the general principle, the general paradigm, which I will keep calling sequential programming. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so 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 while Artos is uh, a huge improvement to the Superloop, um, it has certain shortcomings. But first, let me kind of enumerate what the uh, what the benefits of Artos are. So first of all, it is divide and conquer strategy. So instead of dealing with one messy superloop, because those superloops tend to get messy, messier and messier as you keep grafting on new features. So instead of dealing with the kitchen sink of one superloop, you can partition your problem into those tasks or threads that now are efficiently blocked by the Artos. 
the partitioning itself is not as valuable because you can do this by just by calling different functions. But I'm talking here about partitioning in the time domain because now it is possible that all those uh, super loops, those tasks, appear to be executing simultaneously on a single CPU. Um, so, so the partitioning that I'm talking about is in the time domain, and this is very valu valuable. The second benefit is that you don't waste your CPU cycles on endless polling. For instance, in a Blink example, the useful CPU cycles are one in, in a billion, perhaps, right? Because you, you turning on the LED costs you a few machine instructions, but waiting for a second costs you millions of instructions. But we would and never do this. that. I mean... Yeah. Uh, so, so, and then the third one would be that the Arthos notices very easily when there is, in, then all tasks are blocked, and then it is a good time to put machine to sleep, which allows you to save a lot of power. So all those are benefits, but there are, of course, problems. And um, what I'm trying to achieve here is to explain, because what I see, uh, the biggest disconnect and the problem in the community is that people know about sequential programming. People know about Arthos, but they cannot make the paradigm shift to event-driven programming because they don't know why should they do this. Why should, why should they bother? What what is really the difference between the two? Okay, so we have the benefits of the RTOS, and they are all very still sequential programming. Um, but like I said, I'm still not using an RTOS. Can you can you guide me over to more what you're thinking with this event driven stuff? Yeah. So so the uh, the point of event driven programming is is a completely different viewpoint. It's not sequential, so your system is actually constantly waiting for occurrence of, of an event because an event because the embedded system is naturally very event driven. It it just it just constantly waits for something to happen and then it reacts. And so, what that means is that when when the event occurs, you very quickly handle this event, and then you return very. Uh, after handling this event without ever blocking back to the to the infrastructure that called you. Um, so what happens is that, you know, for instance, the the uh, graphical user interfaces in the early 80s first introduced this concept of event-driven programming. Um, and as you recall, for instance, Windows programs, Windows 3.1, they were not multi-threaded. And yet they they handled most of the events um, in quite timely manner. Of course, there were sh shortcomings, but without multi-threading, they were able to handle multitude of events. And they were structured that way that, that Windows were, were, was in control of the time, and all events were converted into event objects. They were put in the uh, message queue or event queue, and then they were uh, the user-provided code was called uh, to process those events. Um, so this would be the structure of, of an event-driven program. Yeah, and I think uh, many UI-based things, even embedded systems, are structured that way these Still days. Yeah. to this day, yeah. they, they, they are structured that way. But uh, I would like, again, to contrast this with the uh, sequential programming in which, in which you block in the middle of processing and wait for the event in line, hmm. not returning at all to the caller. Yeah, that's, this that's is, usually bad. There's usually all kinds of badness with just blocking in the middle. Like but that, that, but that is the, that is the, the early paradigm that people choose a lot. The easiest paradigm, yes, it, because yeah. wait it, it five makes milliseconds the most sense from the recipe is simpler than the recipe style of programming, right? Then call me back in right. five milliseconds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So so uh, so now the the main difference is that that uh, in order to have an event driven program you need to have several uh, things. First of all, you need to have event instances, event objects that are ge generated for every event. People often confuse 
events with the event delivery infrastructure. For instance, in Artosis, you often hear that a semaphore is an event or event flags are events. They are not. They are just the infrastructure to deliver events to the blocked tasks. Right. It is like confusing sending mails, sending letters with the postal service. Okay. Semaphores are part of the infrastructure of the postal service, while your letters are those events, messages. All right. So, uh, so you have you have event objects. Then you have to have the the infrastructure that delivers those events and that calls the user code. This means that the control is inverted so that uh, the infrastructure calls your code and not the other way around. Again, when you program within Arthos, you write the, the code for each and every task, and then you call the services such as serv- semaphore and, and time delay and so on. Uh, so this is the main difference between the Arthos and the event-driven infrastructure. Such an infrastructure is called also uh, very often a framework, and the inversion of control is the characteristics of this framework. So from a from a high level, you mentioned these event objects. I'm not quite super clear on that concept. Would it be so? The semaphore is a signaling mechanism, um, and then you have user code that handles the events. Would the event object be similar to, I don't know, in the most basic sense, a a case in a switch statement for a particular event type? Or like an ADC reading? It wouldn't be that the ADC was read, but the actual value of the ADC reading. The contents of the message? Actually, you are very close. It should have, it it will have uh, both pieces of information. First of all, an event has to tell you what happened. And it will be the, then handled in a case statement of a switch. Okay, so this would be the the, discrimi- uh, the discriminator for the switch. Okay, what happened? So, when, let's say that you have an ADC. When you read an AD- ADC, you will generate an event, and the very first thing that uh, this event will uh, tell you in its signal part is what happened. So, ADC uh, conversion has happened, and then it ha- it can have event parameters, and this could be different for for every event. And this particular one would have ADC reading inside, let's say 16-bit quantity, that, that tells you the actual measured value. So when you receive this event, you will know what happened, ADC has converted, and you will know the value at, at the same time. Okay, and then our, our event-driven thing... I guess we should call it an actor because that's what we're going to eventually call it, uh, can handle that and can do whatever it needs to do given that it saw that event. That's right. The, the most interesting part in this is that it should handle this possibly quickly and uh, in a run to completion way. That means that it should process one event at a time. It should not be uh, any such situation that it will have to process another event while still busy with the previous one. The structure of uh, event loop, also called message pump sometimes, guarantees this one at a time processing, this run to completion processing. So, so, so it, you call this, it has to return, and then the loop loops back, takes new event if possible, and then dispatches it uh, to to the active object for processing. Hmm. I kind of like the idea of, of message pump, because if you think about it that way, if you think about that the messages come in and the messages go out, and your goal in this thing is not to wait on anything, but to handle it and pass on whatever you need to pass on, whether it's a new event, whether it's an ADC start conversion and a send back to the mothership, the actual value, or whether it's to turn on a motor if the value is low enough. So you, you go ahead and you, you get your ADC value, you turn on the motor if the value is below a threshold, and then you pass on the message that says in 10 seconds or when the ADC is low enough, uh, turn off the motor. You don't wait to turn off the motor, you pass it along. Right. Yeah, exactly. and I think that's that's the piece I was missing, is that this it's you're all in on event, uh, <laughs> you're all in on the event 
uh, model, right. right? So it's not right. just that you have a case switch statement and you get messages and then you go off and do your normal sequential stuff based on all those. It's that right. inside the handlers, you might trigger other events and in fact, all of your actions are event-based. Yeah, but and I wanted to just point out what Alicia said is very, very important here, is that when you generate an event, such as, you know, because the ADC conversion was below a threshold, you might turn on or turn off the amounter and so on. You generate this event and post it to some other event queue, possibly your own, but you don't wait in line until uh, uh, for this event to be processed. This is called asynchronous uh, right. event posting. This is what it means to be asynchronous. Yeah, and that's actually a concept that higher level languages on desktops like C, uh, Objective C and and mm -hmm. C Sharp have been have been extending to the point where it's almost it's almost ubiquitous. You, you set up these little objects in line in your code and say, okay, this is my asynchronous event, event handler, and something happens and you don't even basically know. You know, it just takes care of it however it wants to, but it's totally right. asynchronous. Um, it's mm -hmm. sometimes hard to come to code that is built like this yes. because Where does it in start? sequential <laughs> version, it's like, okay, this happens and then this and then that. And if there's an error case, I go over here and I do this. But with sequential programming, you have all of these little event actors, or I'm sorry, event programming. You have all these little actors that run around doing whatever it is they need to do. But right. what happens first? It, yeah, it's, it's one of the things that I've had trouble with moving from embedded to desktop sometimes because I'll go and have to do something for an app or uh, in Qt, for example, for a desktop program. And my first couple of hours are spent just stuck because where, where's the entry point? <laughs> right, where, right. Where, where do things so, start? <laughs> so, yeah, and we are very uh, clearly going towards state machines, but l let me only uh, point out this, that all this infrastructure, this event-driven message pump, and uh, reactions to this just by calling functions that that are run to completion. That, so they are just uh, one-shot functions. They are not in endless loops or anything like that. It's just a function that quickly processes and then returns. All this can be implemented with a traditional artos. This could be the guts, the structure of each and every thread. And this run to completion is um, very often misunderstood that it means that the the, the event handler needs to monopolize the CPU while processing an event. It's not true. The, the, event pro the, the event handler can be preempted multiple times by other more important uh, threads that, that can be running on the system. As long as there is no sharing of resources, uh, the, the event handler will eventually complete and, and complete its run to completion step. And it will uh, grab the next event and it will process it. Um, so it is possible to combine preemptive multi-threading with this uh, paradigm. And this is coming, becoming very interesting because it's uh, suitable for hard real-time work. Yes. And the run to completion is nice because it is something you kind of want to do if you're doing any certification, FDA or FAA. It helps with traceability of... of uh, your requirements, so your requirements document and then design and all that. And you can see in the code, this traces all the way back. If you have run to completion, then you, you can trace one to one. And that is so nice. Instead of saying, well, this state machine handles six different use cases and six different traceability points. Um, and so the run to completion has some use there. But you were saying about sharing resources. And one of the things in an embedded system is you don't have a lot of resources, so sometimes you end up sharing things, whether it's memory or or access to the ADC value. How do you how do you avoid sharing? Yes. So um, okay. So first of all, the sharing of resources. What you should do is you should uh, instead of sharing resources, make an an object event-driven object that will be the owner of the resource, the manager of it. Let's say that you have an ADC or some, some screen tool, like for instance, an LCD uh, a GUI. You can make an object that will encapsulate this, will own this, and it, only this object has the rights to access this resource directly. All other objects 
that could be running in the application have only uh, cannot up, uh, access this resource directly, but can only send events to the uh, to the owner to the manager, and this resolves all many many pot potential conflicts and um, serializes the access to the resource. Please note that the event exchange is thread safe. So this is the job of the infrastructure of the framework that runs the show. Uh, so you, you as a programmer don't need to worry about this. So, so you just post events and receive events from, from those uh, owners. That's how you solve that. Uh, you don't share at all. Okay. Well, and to some extent, that's a feature of good encapsulation. I mean, you Absolutely. don't really want to share the lowest level stuff. You want somebody else to have control over it and have everybody say, oh, I want this, and then to have the person with control over it say yes or no. Yes, and I absolutely agree. That is the, but, it, you know, it is um, easy to say something like this, you, those shall not share, but uh, as long as you don't provide any infrastructure, any help uh, to the programmers f to avoid the sharing, this is just, uh, you know, a, a good guideline. But uh, practice will be, in practice, they will have to share and use mutual exclusion such as mutexes. Here, in this paradigm, you provide some mechanism, which is the thread safe events that can be safe, uh, can be sent and received. And this is the game changer, because now it is practical to share, to avoid sharing that way. So we have thread safe events, but I thought we didn't have an RTOS. Well, we can have an RTOS and we can uh, have a variety of RTOSs. Uh, and, and, and that's where it becomes a little bit confusing to people because they think that there is either RTOS or event-driven uh, active objects. But in fact, it could be both at the same time. Okay. Not used to thinking The only thing that. is, of course, how you, how you uh, architect uh, your, uh, your application. Of course. But, but the, the point is that this, that when you start doing this in the event-driven way, which is, a, by the way, the recommendations of, of many experts in, in, in concurrent programming, then all the blocking mechanisms of, of the artists become a problem because they can be used accidentally hmm. uh, while you are not supposed to block. For instance, people... Uh, call uh, event posting to the message queue, and such a message queue might block when it is full. And many artists actually will, will block when the event uh, uh, queue becomes full. Or many people call, uh, uh, for instance, send a message and expect a reply. And what they do is they block in the middle of, of this until they receive the reply through unblocking. And this is a backdoor rece reception of an event. And by the way, it also violates the run to completion semantics that I was you know, trying to explain. Because it means that while processing one event that triggered this whole sending and, and, and receiving a reception of the request, they are also receiving the request, which is another event. So they are not done with the first event while receiving the other. And they are violating at this point they run to completion semantics, and then they get in, uh, themselves in, into trouble, really. So you really have to understand the uh, the primitives that are making up your your infrastructure to know that you're not screwing up your kind of your, your rules about uh, running to completion. Right. Yeah, but the, but the problem is, you know, when you use an Arthos, most of the Arthos primitives are blocking. So when you buy an Arthos. Most of the money that you are spending is exactly for those primitives. And now you are, I'm telling you not to use them. So first of all, you know, this, this goes counter this, this um, guideline that, you know, an API should be easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. When you use an RTOS in a situation like this, it is just all too easy to use blocking mechanisms inadvertently. So it is too easy to do incorrect things. I'm well, st I'm still yeah. I'm I'm still back to okay you you you're convincing me not to use an RTOS <laughs> but I was already on that boat. I mean, I like RTOSs and sometimes they're very useful. But Oh, I like them too, but uh, <laughs> but for, for what provide, you're saying, yeah. it it, yeah. it isn't providing what I want at that point. Yes. 
what are my options if I don't want to do an RTOS, but I also don't want to do a sequential state machine super loop? Well, uh, up to this point, uh, there were, uh, you know, you, you need to create an infrastructure, an event driven infrastructure all by yourself. So you need to kind of invent your own event objects. You need to repurpose the message queues from an artist for your event queues. You, you need to invent um, uh, event driven way of delivering timeouts, so, so time events and some other basic mechanisms uh, uh, to, to handle all those things in a event-driven way. Uh, the, the other options you had was to use a modeling tool such as IBM Rhapsody and others that come with built-in event-driven frameworks of that sort. For instance, uh, Rhapsody comes with OXF, uh, IDF, and other frameworks. Uh, so you could reuse those. And uh, for that reason, that there are not so many choices. Uh, I have developed a QP framework, and, uh, and, uh, and this would be another choice. There are, of course, other frameworks out there uh, available, but not that many, and uh, certainly not as frequently available as, uh, as, as RTOS. When I have programmed, like Chris was saying, on a, a computer, uh, a non-embedded computer, and ended up using event-driven uh, for like UIs and whatnot, I don't, there isn't a huge framework. It's a bunch of right. messages. Right. Why do I need a framework? I mean, I, I can definitely, I can definitely do a timer. I mean, I've done that a lot where a, a timer will, I won't block on the timer. I'll call back when necessary. Um, or I'll put things in interrupts if they're very, very small. Or just have an interrupt, um, have a, a flag that I can then check for and call the necessary function that does everything it needs to do. Why do I need more than that? What is it? What is it buying me other than lost RAM and cycles, which of course right. we never have enough yeah. of? Well, f first of all, when you're programming um, on a desktop, and all you need to write. Uh, are those event handlers, that means that you're already using a framework because you are not writing all the code that calls your uh, event handlers. This is provided to you already. So in a sense, you are already using a framework. This framework uh, is rudimentary and, um, and provides the event-driven uh, you know, event queue and, and, and perhaps timeout, timeout uh, me mechanism mechanisms, but typically does not provide state machines. And this would be the next step that would I, I would like to talk about and, and, and why you would even need state machines. Um, so so that, that would be my answer to your question. Okay. So you need a framework. You need a framework. You need this inverted control that calls your code rather than you writing the code from scratch every time. Which is something we rail against a lot, having to write the code from scratch every time. So, <laughs> Yeah. So what happens when you write those event handlers often is that you end up, uh, so, so what happens is this, because it is no longer a sequential code, you cannot store the context in the sequence. So remember that when, when the sequential code like Blinky was there, that you could wait and you knew, and you knew that it was after you turned the, the LED say on and before you are going to turn it off. So when the, when the delay elapses, you know that you need to turn it off you have the context in the sequence. When you have to return every single time to the calling infrastructure, you lose this sequence. You lose the call stack, essentially. That's what it is. And, and so what happens is that you have to replace this context somehow. And what people do is they invent flags and variables. For instance, they could invent a flag that LED was on, Okay, so now if LED on, turn it off, otherwise turn it on, and so on. And, and this very quickly, uh, as, the, uh, as the situation becomes more and more complex, keeps adding more flags, more ifs, and more else's, and it quickly de de degenerates into something that programmers know as spaghetti code. And this is where the state machines come in, because the state machines are the best known spaghetti reducers we know <laughs> of. Right, because then you, it, it isn't if the LED is on, it's if I am in LED on state, 
then exactly. my only other option is LED off state. Right. So what happens is now you, you will replace this with a state machine that has those two states, as you just said. And so if you are in LED off and your timeout event occurs, you know what to do. You need to transition, you need to turn the LED on and off, whatever the, the state was, and you will change your state because now you are, if you are in on state, you are, you are going into off state and so on. So now we are ping ponging between those two states with, and, and please note that every time you handle the same event, timeout event. So the event is identical every time, but you process it completely differently, you, depending on your state. And the whole beauty of this approach is that instead of handling the whole bunch of variables that people keep inventing and, and, and then you have, they have to introduce ifs and else's, you have just one variable that remembers the current state. Is this state on or off or perhaps 100 other values, 100 other states that you might have? And, and, and this is just one variable and uh, that, um, that is simple to, I mean, first of all, uh, doesn't cost much to store and remembers so much, uh, all the relevant context. But you have to be careful because we do want these to be small. You don't want an LED on and ADC is converting state and an LED on and ADC is finished converting state and an LED on and an ADC is off and LED off with all of those three. That That's ridiculous. You want little tiny state machines or or as small as they can be and have several of them that handle their own particular area instead of making a giant one. Is that, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yes and no. Yes and what, no. <laughs> what, uh, you certainly don't want your state machine to grow too big because it's difficult to understand. And unfortunately, the traditional state machines t have this tendency that's called the state transition explosion uh, problem. And because sort of what, like what, what happens saying. is that, that very often you have events that are handled identically in a group of states. For instance, when you model uh, a desktop calculator, you have, you have the button clear and off. And in whichever state of the computation you might be, you are supposed to clear the display when somebody presses C or turn the calculator off when they press the off button. So in every the, the, the such state, you have to handle those two events in the same way. But the traditional state machine will have no way of, of avoiding those repetitions. So in whichever state you are, you have to always have those two transitions in there, repeating over and over and over again. And, and so this is the shortcoming of traditional finite state machines. So, so I think that what you are asking for is what would be the mechanism then to try to reuse those common transitions uh, rather than repeating them over and over? And the answer is hierarchical state machines, also known as HRL state charts or UML state machines. Okay. I, I, I'm familiar with them as hierarchical, but not UML. Uh why, why are they UML state machines? Well, the history is this, that uh, David Harrell uh, invented this whole state chart uh, formalism, I guess it was in the 80s, uh, when he worked for Israeli uh, Air Force. And um, this concept then became very, very popular. Um, the real-time object-oriented modeling room method took it over and um, introduced the room actor that, that uh, exactly had the behavior specified by the Harrell state chart. They called it room, room chart at the time. And then uh, the UML uh, just um, adopted it, just took it uh, pretty much uh, exactly how, in, how it was invented by Harrell. Hmm. And they are now called UML state charts, but it is uh, essentially the same concept or very, very closely related. Okay, for people who haven't heard of these things. ROOM is a an acronym, R-O-O-M. It's all right. capitalized. I have no idea what it means. UML is a unified modeling language, which is, right. if you've seen design patterns or you've seen C++ programs and they're, they're described or using uh, graphs with lots of boxes and arrows mm -hmm. and they have special boxes and arrows that mean certain things about objects and what's a call and what's inherited and all that. That's UML. Um, right. 
we don't use a lot of UML in embedded systems. It, right. Our field isn't really known for embracing either UML or code generation. But I know yeah. that you are very passionate about both of those things. What kind of response? How do you convince people? I think that it's uh, very unfortunate that we don't use that as much as possible. On the other hand, I absolutely understand that UML became so big and so complicated uh, that it uh, stopped adding too much value for for what it what it cost to understand uh, all this stuff. So uh, I think that uh, we shouldn't be throwing out the baby with the bathwater completely. Uh, forgetting about UML, uh, but uh, rather we should take uh, pieces of this that, that are relevant to our work, and and one of those is um, those state machines that are now part of the UML. I, I I'm not um, you know saying that all other parts uh, are equally valuable. I don't use most of the UML. In fact, I I, I typically use the uh, state chart diagram, and and I like sequence diagrams, and then we probably all use them perhaps not even knowing that um, they are also part of the UML and st standardized. You do have a nice uh, and short PDF about object-oriented programming in C, which secretly includes a refresher on UML that I found very useful. Oh, uh, thank you. Be, I mean, the object-oriented part, if you haven't done object-oriented programming in C and you wonder what that is, Miro's PDF, which will be in the show notes, uh, definitely gives you the overview, the the good parts, and it shows you a little bit about the, the, the parts people hate, which is the function pointers. But personally, it was having a place where all of the UML that I would actually use in one spot was kind of <laughs> cool. But right. you also have a book that is UML-based, and it's UML and state charts. Uh, what's the title of right. the book? I, I yeah, so, so there were two editions of the book. The first one was practical state charts in C and C++, and then in the second edition, we just added uh, practical UML state charts in C and C++. So this um, the second edition was published in 2008. Okay. So that will, of course, be in the show notes. And what was it like writing that book? Oh, well, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I learned a lot from the first edition. Uh, I had, um, uh, for my first edition, I had a wonderful... Um, editor, Robert Ward, we actually became friends, he visited me a couple of times, and he constantly corrected my non-idiomatic use of the English language, <laughs> obviously, it's a second or third language for me, uh, but, you know, I, I learned from him uh, tons of things, um, he was the former, actually, editor of CC++ Users Journal, he actually created this this magazine. Uh, so, so the, I had very, very good experience writing the first edition. Second edition, I, uh, uh, it's much bigger. I decided to put uh, all the source code there and explain it. It's pretty much uh, like uh, Jean Leprose uh, explains in his Micro COS book. I, I still admire his books, so I, I wanted to uh, emulate him in this respect. So the second book is much bigger. But I, I started every chapter with short introduction and an explanation, what kind of problem I'm trying to address and solve with this. So even if you just uh, read um, the intro, the first um, few paragraphs of the ch chapter, you will kind of have an overview of what it is about. And if you want to go deeper, you obviously can, can read the rest. Well, the code. So did you, so I'm looking at doing a second edition for my book and I have been writing the code that probably should have gone with the book to start with. I didn't want to put it in the book. I just wanted to link to it. What right. made you decide to actually put the code in? I wanted to explain the code. Okay. Um, you know, so, so because people just, as you said, there are not so many frameworks out there. And uh, I saw my mission with this book, similar to Jean Labrosse's mission, that uh, he explained the articles for the first time in this public way. Uh, so I, I was kind of uh, thinking that I'm explaining the object-oriented uh, active object framework and state machines uh, to uh, to embedded folks, uh, engineers like me. So that's what, uh, what, why I, I put the source code there too. Okay. I want to make sure we get to some listener questions. As I said, you've been requested as a guest a few times. So let's see. One from Andre, uh, who 
is famously, at least in my little world, opposed to flow charts of all varieties. He calls them <laughs> flaw charts. Flaw charts. <laughs> and uh, yes, flusses. But he likes your state charts more and wants to know how to annotate interrupts in the state charts. Oh, wow. Well, I, I'm not it's sure. It's nice that we don't have a whiteboard to go with this, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I could understand this question uh, um, in two ways. First of all, um, there could be state, state uh, I mean, the, the interrupts can themselves be structured as uh, state machines, right? So a state, uh, an interrupt is a run to completion, uh, one shot, um, single shot routine that has to run quickly and, and then return. Obviously, so it is ideal actually to use a, a state machine there, um, and um, the, uh, and there are of course many types of interrupts. Some of them are v for a single purpose. For instance, a timer uh, expires, and then uh, what you have is that you don't have that you have only one kind of event, which uh, which drives the whole uh, state machine in this case, which will be just the expiration of the timeout, the timer interrupt. In this case. There is no special annotation I would use. It's just um, just the mere fact of invoking the state machine uh, uh, drives it. So you have one type of event. I would call it a timeout, say. There are other interrupts that are kind of kitchen sink uh, in which you have to go to the hardware and find out why this interrupt happened and then read some registers and, and figure out based on that information what actually happened. And then at this point, you can create an event and dispatch it to the internal state machine of the, of the associated with this interrupt. And again, in the diagram, it will be, uh, you will see only those events that you dispatch. You will not see any special annotation. And the other way of looking at this question would be that interrupts produce events that are then consumed at the task level by active objects. And, uh, and then again, it will not be any special annotation that, that, that actually the purpose of, of interrupts is to produce events. So what they do is they create events, they write some information to them. For instance, ADC con uh, conversion just happened and uh, they read the uh, ADC value, put it in the event and they post it asynchronously and it will be later processed by the state machine. And so in the state machine, you will see ADC convert event. That's all. So if I'm understanding correctly, the interrupts themselves are a form of actor object and the event that it gets coming in, it comes from the hardware, it comes from the chip, it's the actual event itself. And the event that it could be putting out is a, a, a more global framework event of what it is, whether it is a timer that expired or a UART now has data in a buffer that it has been putting in. Uh, right. Is that, so they're just, they're just objects like everything else. It just happens to, that their message queue comes from the processor or hardware. Well, you, well, certainly sp speaking, um, in, in, for instance, in the QP framework that I can talk about is, uh, they are not considered active objects. This, these are just, um, mechanism to produce events. That's the okay. purpose in life that uh, that interrupts have. They don't even have an event queue. That's why they cannot be considered active objects. So it is not possible to post an event to, to an interrupt. Uh, uh, so they are just functions that mostly produce interrupts. They can have associated state machines with them um, uh, because you know, sometimes that, that could be useful. But I typically don't even code them as as complicated uh, or, or big uh, hierarchical state machines, I typically use just a switch statement um, just right away in the body of the interrupt. Yeah, because you don't want to put much in your interrupt. I mean, yeah, I, I'm absolutely for for simplicity. So keep it simple and uh, and use the, the the heavy tools only when when needed. Yeah, the only the only interrupt I can think of as a good state machine was uh, I squared C. If you have to deal with the I squared C signaling mechanisms whether or right. not you're in a, an ACK or a restart state it's exactly. all very state right. machiney but but if you're just expiring a timer eh, just fire off right. an event cool yeah exactly so so not even big state machine just um, post an event all, all all you do is that and from Altronic 
uh, when does the state machine model break down or hit its limitations? Uh, for some background, he does a lot of wearables and the state machine paradigm is pretty much perfect. He doesn't do embedded Linux and his preference is bare metal, avoiding RTOSs as much as possible to keep things simple. So yeah, when does the state machine model break down? Well, frankly, I have not experienced this uh, breakdown yet. I mean, um, I the biggest system I worked on was at GE Medical that we had over a million lines of code. And then in hindsight, I, I would say that this was an event-driven system. We didn't have uh, problems with, uh, for instance, race conditions because the designers were clever enough to 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 give us only you know callback functions that we will have to then implement, and there was no concurrency hazards uh, hazards anymore in this. Uh, so this was a good thing, but we suffered a lot from the um, from the spaghetti code uh, problem. Uh, with tons of uh, ifs and else's and and, and uh, flags and variables, and 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 we we had some state machines, but they were not flexible enough, and they certainly were not hierarchical. I think uh, that this um, GE software, the biggest I worked with, uh, could have been much improved if hierarchical state machines were used in it, and and uh, certainly I would not see. Uh, and the limitations of this method. Um, I, I know that, um, that for instance, uh, room method, real-time object-oriented modeling, that's what it stands for. <laughs> Finally, uh, sorry. Yes, uh, was, was used in, in huge telecommunication switches, and those things are huge. And state machines were with thousands and thousands of states, and it still worked. So that's all I know about scalability. Okay, well... We will we will take that as a it's pretty scalable. Let us know when it fails for you, Altronic. Right. We mentioned I mentioned at the beginning of the show that you're doing a lot of videos, and I wanted to highlight uh, lesson ten in your videos, where you look at Stack Overflows, and you wrote about it on Embedded Gurus with more detail on how you identify a stack overflow. Can you tell us a little bit about how you think most people are finding them and how you suggest we debug them? Well, uh, in this lesson, just uh, to very quickly tell the, 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 the people who, who might not know is, I show uh, what a stack overflow can look like. And uh, I specifically kind of arranged the situation that a return address was corrupted. And uh, what ended, ended up happening is that, the, that instead of returning correctly, the, the, the CPU went off and started to execute its own vector table. <laughs> and so it plowed ahead through this, like, through this data, which, uh, which in ARM processor are just simply addresses of, of event handlers, of uh, interrupt handlers, and it plowed through this data as through code, and then happened to reset itself and started to execute again. <laughs> so in this particular case, it was, I, I arranged it obviously, uh, to show how sneaky uh, a stack overflow can be because the, the CPU actually never stopped working. It was resetting as, itself hundreds of times per second. Uh, so, so obviously uh, all bets are off when stack overflow um, happens. So it is very difficult. That, that's why it is difficult to detect it reliably in, um, and say that this and this would be the symptom because the symptoms can be so different. So random. It's so exactly. hard to reproduce. I mean, it's com yeah, completely blows your mind. It's, uh, it's not rational what's happening. Yeah. So, so then I, I, I also was fascinated with um, Michael Barr's deposition in the uh, Toyota case of unintended acceleration, and he describes uh, that most likely his bet was that um, it was possible to to um, uh, cause this unintended acceleration by stack overflow, by overflowing the stack, and just right under the stack there was this operating system data, and um, and uh, just one flip in this one bit flipped in this data would would actually make one task uh, be forgotten by the by the scheduler 
And this was obviously the, the most important uh, throttle control task. So now I was uh, thinking how, I always actually think that way, uh, is it anything that could have been done uh, to begin with uh, to avoid the situation? And, and then my first idea was maybe I can move the stack such that, that it would overflow and not corrupt the most valuable data that we had in the system. So where would I put the stack? And then I thought maybe putting the, the stack at the place at the beginning of RAM such that the stack will grow towards the, the, the beginning of RAM uh, would help because then you will not destroy your any valuable data. And so that's what I suggested in, in, in my blog post on, on embedded gurus. And so you put the stack in a place that if you overflow, it causes a hardware or it causes a, an interrupt and therefore you get an error interrupt. And if you ever are in that error interrupt, you really should consider resetting or crying for help or something really important, putting a breakpoint, uh, because that's bad. If you got there, that's really, really bad. Yeah. Well, first of all, all this has to be tested for a very particular processor. I experimented with this with ARM processor, and I, so I put the stack... You know, you need to know which which way the stack grows on which processor. Typically, it is a descending stack. Most processors have the descending stack, meaning that the stack grows toward lower addresses. So when you put it at the beginning of RAM, okay, it grows, and so overflow will will breach the beginning of RAM, and it will go into area that is no longer has no longer valid RAM. And now it depends on the processor what will happen in this case. ARM processor calls the hard hard fault exception, yeah. which you can implement. Mm -hmm. So instead of going into the unknown land and keeping resetting itself or something, or forgetting a task, which was which was much better than resetting the machine, by the way you know about it, so you can do yeah. something about it. And so you you stay in control rather than losing the control completely. I mean, you still have the problem that something awful has gone wrong and you probably can't recover 100%, but at least you know it happened. And where. And, and maybe where. Well, or closer to where. <laughs> closer to where. Because a lot of times with oh. those kinds of problems, you've already moved so far past the initial cause that it's right. almost impossible to retrace your steps. Yeah. And, but this requires, as you said, understanding how the chip works a little bit and being able to modify the linker file in a way that lets you do this. But linker right. files remain one of those things people are afraid of. With good reason, you can shoot yourself in the foot there. Um, right. Do you think well, we're going to get better at that? Well, it depends, you know, like the movement, the maker movement that you that you have mentioned, it solves this uh, initial problem, initial kind of problem of getting into the programming in the first place, because they provide everything for you. But on the other hand, it does not teach people uh, how to write the startup code, how to write the linker script, how to how to get going, what's the world even before the main function. So, so can we get better at this? I don't know if makers can, can get better. But professional uh, embedded software engineers certainly need to do it. And, um, and that's yeah. why I, I teach <laughs> my video course to, to show them uh, the, 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 the linker scripts and, and, and stack overflows and, and all of this. And there are so many of these, not really secrets, but almost secrets that make it so that you can be a much more effective debugger, a much more effective engineer um, from design just all the way to debug and test. But it is sometimes not obvious. I mean, that whole, okay, how does a Stack Overflow work? Then I need to know about the chip. Then I need to know about the linker file. And I need to know enough about my application to be able to do RAM. And then once I have an RTOS, I can't use any of this because now I have multiple stacks. And it it's a lot of data that you can't throw at somebody who hasn't right. stared at it for hours and hours. Yeah. So, you know, to me, this stack overflow is, is actually just a small part, a, 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 a small part of a bigger thing. And, and that bigger thing is designed by contract formally, but, uh, but really uh, peppering your code with assertions, which I highly recommend. And uh, so to me, 
placing the stack at the right place in RAM so that when it overflows, you have some hardware fault is just an, an example of hardware-assisted assertion. So what happens is that you, uh, you get a hardware fault, and which you need, and it is catastrophic. You cannot continue from there, right? So you, you need to design your um, recovery strategy to uh, kind of control the damage. And very often it uh, turns out that it is the best uh, course of action is just to quickly reset the system. But, um, but I would just recommend that instead even to look into all those hardware um, gotchas of how to get the hardware to behave correctly, you pepper your code with enough assertions. And I don't know how it happens, but when the assertion density is high enough, almost all failures uh, manifest themselves as assertion uh, assertions. So you no longer have hard, hole, hard faults or something like that. You end up hitting an assertion. And this is the best course of action because assertion allows you to remain in control and at least do the damage control. So, um, so that's why, for instance, QP frameworks are uh, uh, have the right density of assertions. I know that NASA JPL coding standard recommends very highly to to have um, I don't know how many a few assertions per function they recommend, uh, so that they they maintain their high high density of assertions and. Um, I also uh, recommend highly to keep assertions uh, enabled, especially in production code, especially in safety critical code like medical devices. It is controversial. Not many people will turn the assertions off, but I think it's a mistake. Yeah, that's the common thing is, oh, we have the assertions for development and then we take them out. And of course, our code size goes down and we go faster because we're not doing all these checks. But yeah, you're not doing all those checks either. So. <laughs> You have to be right. utter, utterly convinced so, that you're never going to hit. So I am amazed when people will implement uh, M MPU, which is me memory protection unit, uh, which costs a lot. And, uh, say uh, uh, cycles when when you use an Arthos, we have to set up the MPU every time and so on. So they they will uh, they will pay uh, for for an Arthos that will do it, uh, but they will not ship with, uh, ship their code with assertions that they can put in their code. That that's uh, that doesn't doesn't make sense to me because uh, an MPU is a form of assertion. So they like those assertions, but they don't like other assertions. Yeah. They, they should be using everything uh, that they can, uh, I think. So let's talk about assertions for just a sec. Uh, when I do assertions in code that doesn't have an RTOS, it is often um, pound deft to be a breakpoint and then a debug log for whatever the error was. The debug log might go out to a serial port. It might get written to flash. It depends on the system. It just mm -hmm. needs to be recorded. Is that the sort of assert you're talking about? I mean, yes. I'm not this handling is exactly anything the assertion. there. I'm unless just I'm only rebooting. going one. Yeah, that's exactly the assertion that I'm talking about. Except that I'm going one step further, and I'm saying that in the release code, you should have the same assertions still enabled, but the uh, assertion handler or the you know the, the routine that gets called when assertion breaks should be very very carefully designed and tested um, to do what so that it will do the damage control and okay. um, and, and and react co uh, correctly so put the system in a safe state whatever that means yeah whatever that means yeah for instance we we uh, I, I once worked on an insulin pump and uh, and in that case, what, uh, when insertion broke, what we decided to do was not to pump insulin, obviously, because overdose is not good. Uh, not to stop pump pumping, obviously, because uh, because the patient that uh, that will not get insulin will will get sick also. So what we ended up doing is we stopped the device. We started the the, uh, the buzzer and vibrator to alert the user. Uh, that the device is no longer reliable, and uh, and and uh, this was the best course of action in that particular case. But but this was carefully tested. This was test tested uh, with the conditions of uh, stack overflow, for instance. So so before calling this routine, we will carefully reset the stack to the reasonable value and so on. Uh, it was very carefully tested under many conditions, and I think that it was the best we, we could we could do. And you do have to make these asserts. They need to be when things are very bad, not 
oh, I got an odd error or I got an odd message. I just want to send it out to the debug log. I don't. Asserts are, are critically bad, not kind of bad. Oh, 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 yeah. That's a very good good point. I actually brought a, a blog post about it or an article. Uh, so so you need to distinguish between exceptional conditions and bugs. Uh, so, so assertions are for bugs, something that should never happen in the code. Mm. Yes. And uh, except- if you have... Uh, you know, uh, conditions in the code that are off the main path, but can happen, can be legitimately happen in your system, then you obviously has to have to design uh, code and handle those, even though such code typically is even bigger than, than the main use case of your device. Very often those exceptions take more code than the rest, but still you need to design and, uh, and implement and test this code. So, so yes, absolutely. You have to very care- carefully and care- uh, be able to distinguish when when the situation is a bug that should never happen in a, in a system, or it is an exception condition that you need to handle. And, and the bugs and not, you not assert. use an assertion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Excellent. So I want to go back to how do how do people learn these these things. How do you learn about asserts? How do you learn about handling a stack overflow with a hardware interrupt? And it this all goes back to the question you asked us before we started the show, which is, what do you read? How do you stay up to date? Or even right. learn from the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Right. So how do you? <laughs> no, 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 I was asking you. I was, <laughs> I was sidestepping the question entirely. <laughs> Well, you know, I, I am still a little bit um, uh, old date, uh, uh, meaning that I still lived in the good times when uh, every uh, month uh, we had Embedded Systems Programming Magazine full of of this uh, of, of excellent articles. I, I was so looking forward to every every installment of this. Uh, we had Dr. Dobbs. We had CC++ Users Journal. I don't know if you remember all those. Oh, all yeah. Those oh, yeah. And um, so, so I learned a lot from reading uh, this. Uh, I also went to conferences, and the system conference was a good source uh, to me. Um, and um, but then, you know, with the advent of internet, things started to fade away, and um, I don't see that many resources there right now. We have blogs, but blogs don't replace in-depth articles, in my view. <laughs> Tell that to Andre, who's on part number 38 of, of Welcome to Embedded Systems. And I think Spec is on 28 or something. But yes, um, it is hard to Most find. Most blogs aren't long multi-series. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're taking big magazine kind of series and turning them into blogs. Not, yeah. Not the and they're clipping around. them up into like base three blog posts per article, really. Right. And uh, there are a couple of other blogs that I like, uh, that can be in depth, but I agree. I do miss, I miss the articles because they were edited and they were a little better thought out sometimes with a plan. Um, Yeah. Very often with source code and you could experiment with them. And, um, yeah, I mean, this was, this was an excellent resource, but there are, other oh, resources. There, there are the blogs. There are a number of YouTube channels. I know you have one, um, Philip Koopman, who will be on the show mm-hmm. next year, which is really soon, uh, has a nice video series and yeah, contextual electronics. Too, by the way, yeah, I, li- I like this. Uh, his his uh, embedded software, better embedded software, or some something like this. I, I enjoy yeah. his book immensely. Yeah. Um, so they, there are still resources, but so many of the resources are also branded. I mean, I would probably look more through some of the forums, except I don't want to look through the Nordic forum separate from the ST forum, separate from blah, 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 when right. half the information is the same and the other half is so chip specific, I don't care. Um, so yeah, I don't have any great resources right now. Of course, we one reason to do the podcast is to con exactly. people exactly like you <laughs> right. to come in and to answer all of my questions. There was right. that one we did about internationalization where I had 
really high powered expert come in and I just asked him all of my internationalization questions for the project I was working on. That was perfect. <laughs> um, but in, unless you have your own podcast, I'm not sure how you you get people to to tell you all these things. Yeah, uh, you know, a, a similar resource to yours, there is a embedded software radio or something like this on the internet, but this is general purpose computing. So so this is not embedded specific, but uh, they had some very interesting podcasts as well. I'll have to look at that. I guess, I guess that's all I have. I mean, I actually have a lot more questions and a lot more in the outline, but I think we're about out of time. Okay, thank you. I, I, I don't have much of a, of uh, closing thoughts, except maybe this, that um, there are, uh, you know, the Superloop and Artos are not the only game in town. Uh, there are some, some other options, such as uh, frameworks, event-driven frameworks, active objects, and state machines. And um, some systems can th certainly benefit from them. I, I'm not saying that they are universally uh, going to replace Superloop or Artos any day, any day now, but some systems such as uh, safety critical medical devices and, and some other systems that actually need to demonstrate design and traceability, uh, they, they can certainly benefit. And, uh, you know, I, I've been doing this for the last maybe 15 years, working with this these concepts. And I will tell you that I will never, I mean, go back to the old days. And for me, um, programming uh, that way is much more fun because I don't no longer struggle with spaghetti code, with race conditions and all of those things. Um, I just program at a higher level of abstraction. And then those abstractions are actually right, right, high enough and right abstractions so that I can use modeling. For instance, I can use state machines from the UML specifications. Well, one of the takeaways so. from this conversation that, that, that I have is that uh, it really helps to have a design paradigm that forces you to think because if you go straight into sequential programming you just open your editor and you start typing that's you know the way a lot of people program uh, and you know just hack it out until it works and then you end up with spaghetti code but it works and then you know you find what's wrong right. if you do something like state machines or event driven programming you can't do that you can't just sit down and start hacking away you have to at least write something right. up on a piece of paper and say okay yeah. here are my states here's these events and here are the handlers you're forced to plan and i think that's really it's really valuable because planning gets lost a lot of times when we're trying to work quickly and yeah. it's nice to have something that that's that kind of forces you to do it because there's a benefit to programming this way and using these frameworks and and, and the, these paradigms in and of themselves but the fact that they force you to think about what you're doing before you do it, I think, is a major a major side benefit. Right, and and it also changes the way you think of of, of those problems entirely. So instead of thinking, you know, of, uh, of which uh, Arthos primitives, which semaphores, which uh, event flags I would be using, you will think at different different in terms of different things of which events would I produce, what kind of uh, active objects I need. Uh, you think uh, about how how you want how to, how to best encapsulate your resources so that you don't need to share them, and then you inside each active object you have the prescribed recipe how to do this. You have a state machine. It will be a state machine, so it, you, you know right away what what will happen, and then you try to structure your state machine the best way you can. And this is another topic for another big conversation: how to structure best state machines because. Yeah, Not many people know that, but <laughs> um, but this is uh, actually you know different way of thinking about the problem. Well, and as you as you and Chris summed up, I'm I'm sitting here thinking this would be a lot easier to test. <laughs> you have Absolutely. you have events coming in. You have a small number of things you need to do. You have an algorithm. You have events going out. That that Not makes just it to test, but to log. Right, also, if you have a flow. All of if, those, yeah. all of the above. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for testing, Alicia is absolutely right because the active objects are natural units for testing because yeah. they don't share anything, so they don't have any dependencies. In unit testing, the most difficult part is how to handle the, the dependencies. You pull out the piece of code and it has hundreds of of of, of you know unsatisfied uh, references to things. So so it is much easier because you you don't share anything. So exactly. so this is the testing part. And uh, and the logging is 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 uh, again uh, because framework reverses the control, 
So the framework is in control, and framework knows everything that happens in the application, not just what the artist knows, you know, knows but which context has been switched and which semaphore was used. The framework knows it too, but the framework also knows about which events were posted, what states have been visited, what transitions happened. And this information was not available in the in the Artos. And uh, QP frameworks are instrumented that way, so you can get all this information in, uh, if you want to. This does seem like a good place to stop because I think that is a great summary on why this is worth looking at. Our guest has been Miro Samek. He is the founder of Quantum Leaps, the creator of the open source QP Active Object Framework, and author of Practical UML State Charts in C, C++, Event-Driven Programming for Embedded Systems. Thank you for being with us, Miro. Thank you for having me. And I would like to send a special thank you out to Altronic and Peter Nye, who both requested recently that we have Miro on. I'd also like to thank Christopher for producing and co-hosting. And of course, thank you for listening and for supporting us on Patreon. It's pretty cool. We're very happy. If you would like to read the blog, contact us and or subscribe to the YouTube channel, go ahead to http colon slash slash embedded dot fm. You can do it all there. Why did you spell that out? <laughs> I just, I feel like people maybe don't, I don't know. Search for embedded.fm. Search for embedded podcast. Search for however you'd like to spell my name and embedded and it'll work out. <laughs> You'll find it. A final thought from Stephen Fry, whose QI TV show I am now in love with. We are not nouns. We are verbs. I'm not a thing, an actor, a writer. I am a person who does things. I write, I act, and I never know what I'm going to do next. I think you can be imprisoned if you think of yourself as a noun. Embedded is an independently produced radio show that focuses on the many aspects of engineering. It is a production of Logical Elegance, an embedded software consulting company in California. If there are advertisements in the show, we did not put them there and do not receive money from them. At this time, our sponsors are Logical Elegance and listeners like you.